Let's take your Bible and go to 2 Samuel chapter 6. We're going to finish, uh, finish up the series I've been bringing on Wednesday nights on A Man After God's Own Heart. This is part three, David, A Man of Worship. You know what, that's a very important thing, and it's a very important thing to God. It ought to be a very important thing to us. Uh, worship is everything, you know. I, I know I've preached a couple weeks on this, on, on David's life, and, you know, he's the only one in the whole Bible that God said was a man after his own heart, and when God makes a statement like that, you just really need to dive in and find out what you can do to even come close, you know. And this was part of, uh, we, you know, we, it was part of it, uh, of the greatness of David in the eyes of the Lord is, you know, we understand that he was a man of contentment and character, and that those make uh, for attributes of greatness in the sight of the Lord. That I want to look at David in the light of the worship of God tonight, Worship really is the utmost important in God's people. Worship is the missing ingredient really in the lives of many, and it's reflected in a lack of biblical worship within the local church. You know, we will never worship publicly, and I've said this before, until we've learned to do it privately. Worshiping the Lord privately well, it's not a big deal to do it publicly because you're used to doing it. So many people don't uh, enter that kind of a mode because they're not used to doing it and they don't do it in their private life. Therefore, it makes it harder when you're out publicly in the assembly, in the congregation to enter into that kind of a thing. And, you know, um, that was one of the things that God laid on my heart about even bringing the offering plates up forward is it gives it gives you a chance to really look inside. It's not about money. It's about worship. That's what it's about. It's about and you know what? I, and it just brought just about brought tears to my eyes. You know this this thing was was played for a long long time. Played uh, played hymns and praised God. This is an instrument that was used to praise God. And then for two years it was silent. And when they brought it in, they set it up, and Mrs. Kale sat down and, and began to play. One of the songs that she played was, I Will Worship You. And, and I almost cried. I, I, I felt the tears inside because now she can praise God again. And it's an instrument used to bring praise and worship to the Lord because of the fact that it puts you in that mode. It puts you in that idea of, of, of bringing before, just being caught up in, in even the music, be caught up uh, in the spirit of the Lord, in the Lord's house, and just bringing an offering before him. It's just, it makes it a little extra special. It's the different. here's the difference. Going to the birthday party and put, setting the gift on the table or handing it to the, or handing it to the person. What do you like to do better? Do you like to just put your gift right there on the table and walk away? Or do you like to say, hey, look what I got you. And you take it and you put it in, and you put it in their hands, and they see that, and the joy that's there brings you joy because you were able to bring it to them and give it to them. That is the heart behind bringing the offering plates up here for me. It's a mode and an attitude of worship. You know what? I just, I just want to come up here and and just bring it before Him. He's all through this building. He's in the back if you put it in the back. You don't worship any less at the back than you do at the front. I'm just saying that it's, it's to me, is a specialness for those that want to worship the Lord in that way, that they feel moved by the Holy Spirit to bring, to just bring 
not only bring it into the, into the house, but to bring it before the Lord. It's a beautiful thing to me. It's, it speaks to me that way. And so uh, that's because the attitude of worship, real worship of just, just adoration of God, just of, of how good he is and how wonderful he is and what a mess we would be in without him. It's that attitude that he is my everything. It is that attitude that promotes me to do the things that I would do for him. So that's what we want to look at. Uh, and, and I know I haven't read any scripture <laughs> yet. I just, I just felt like introducing it that way. It's not even on my outline. It's just in my heart that this is one of the things that amidst David's goofs and, and wickedness and blood guiltiness, amidst all of that, his heart loved, sought after, and worshipped the Lord, and that touched the heart of God. And that's what we can do. So in 2 Samuel chapter 6, we're going to read 1 through 11, uh, and then... Uh, I don't know if I'm going to have time to read all of that or not. I was going to read the whole chapter. I may. Let me just see where we're at here in a minute. All right, chapter 6 and verse 1. Again, David gathered together all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000. And David arose and went with all the people that were with him from Bala of Judah to bring up from thence the ark of God, whose name is called by the name of the Lord of hosts, that dwelleth between the cherubims. And they set the ark of God upon a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadab. That was in Gibeah. And Uzzah and Ao, the sons of Abinadab, drave the new cart. And they brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was at Gibeah, accompanying the ark of God. And uh, Ahoyo went before the ark. And David and all the house of Israel played before the Lord on all manner of instruments made of fir wood, even on harps and upon psalteries, timbrels, cornets, and cymbals. When they came near, came to Nacon's threshing floor, Uzzah put forth his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen shook it. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and smote, God smote him there for his error. And there he died by the ark of God. And David was displeased because the Lord had made a breach upon Uzzah, and he called the name of that place Perezua to this day. And David was afraid of the Lord that day and said, How shall the ark of the Lord come to me? So David would not remove the ark uh, of the Lord unto him into the city of David, but David carried it aside into the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite. And the ark of the Lord continued in the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite three months, and the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all of his house. All right, I'm going to keep going. And it was told King David, saying, The Lord hath blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that pertaineth unto him because of the ark of God. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom into the city of David with gladness. And it was so when they bear the ark of the Lord had uh, they that bear the ark of the Lord had gone six paces. He sacrificed oxen and fatlings. And David danced before the Lord with all his might. And David was girded with a linen ephod. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the trumpet. And as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, uh, Michael, Saul's daughter, look through a window and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, and she despised him in her heart. And they brought in the ark of the Lord and set it in his place in the midst of the tabernacle that David pitched for it. And David offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. And as soon as David had made an end of the offering of burnt offerings and peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord of hosts, 
And he dwelt among all the people, even among the whole multitude of Israel, as well as to women and as men, to every one cake of bread. Hey, look there, they had cake. And a good piece of flesh. Hey, they had some meat. And a flagon of wine. So all the people departed, every one to his house. Then David returned to bless his household. And Michal, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said, How glorious was the king of Israel today, who uncovered himself today in the eyes of the handmaidens of his servants, as one of the vain fellows shamelessly uncovereth himself. Sounds like she had a tood. And David said unto Michal, It was before the Lord which chose me before thy father and before all his house to appoint me ruler over the people of the Lord, over Israel. Therefore will I play before the Lord, and I will yet be more vile than thus and will be base in mine own sight and of the hand. Uh, of the of the maidservants which thou hast spoken of, of them shall I be had in uh, honor. <clears throat> Therefore, Michal, the daughter of Saul, had no child into the day of her death. Sounds like she got a little, uh, she got a little bent, got a little jealous, wanted to say something snappy, and got cursed because of it. That isn't good. But I want you to see something. In those first 11 verses, we find David's first attempt at moving the Ark of the Covenant back to the tabernacle where it belonged. In the story, we find the danger of worldly worship characterized. Listen, they set it on a new cart. It wasn't done the way it was supposed to be done. The law was not consulted as to moving the Ark of the Covenant. They decided to come up with their own way. And God did not, God was not pleased with that. The Ark had been taken captive by the Philistines over 20 years earlier and remained with them uh, for seven months. God ch had chastened the Philistines. They made, so they made mice and emeralds of gold and placed them in the Ark and uh, placed the ark on a cart pulled by two milk cows and sent it back to the Israelites. So the ark was placed in the house of Abinadab where it remained for 20 years. Now, in 1 Chronicles chapter 13, we didn't go there, but you'll find it here, David attempted to bring the ark back to the tabernacle by placing it on a new cart that was pulled uh, by oxen with Uzzah and uh, Ohio driving. The new cart was good enough for the Philistines, so it was deemed good enough for David, right? So why did David not know? Why did the high priest not know? Where was the priest that said, hey, we can't do this. It has to be done this way, not that way. They all just went with the flow, man. It's on a cart. Let it be pulled. It's good. We don't have to go back to them old-fashioned, archaic ways of moving it. We'll be good to move it however we want to move it. Wrong. Not okay. Because none of them consulted the word of God that was given to Moses concerning the movement of the ark. It was to be covered. The staves were to be placed within the rings and the priests carrying it upon their shoulders. That's how it was supposed to have been done. But they were having a real worship service in the eyes of everyone else. David and all Israel playing instruments with all their might, the world, the Philistines. This was the way to move the ark. To David and all Israel, it was a wonderful experience. But to God, the new cart and the oxen were not the way to move his presence. Remember, he, he abided there. That was where God, that was where God, the power of God was right there. The oxen stumbled, and Uzzah put forth his hand to stabilize it, and God smote him. You think God can't take care of himself? You think God didn't know that that cow was going to stumble? You think that was God's going to let anything happen to the Ark of the Covenant? Absolutely not. 
and the fact that man thought enough to stop it. And we all probably understand that when you're in charge of moving something, you better hang on to it and make sure that it doesn't slip and fall and break. So even with the good intention in mind, he put forth his hand just to stabilize it. And God got angry and killed him right there dead because he put his hand on the ark. He put his hand on it. That's not what God told you to do. And God sent a message. You don't just do things the way you want to do them. He gave instructions written with his own hand about what to do and, and, how, to, and how to do everything. But in 1 Chronicles chapter 13, verse 7 through 11, it says they carried the ark of God uh, in a new cart out of the house of Abinadab and Uzzah. The Aho drove, drove the cart. David with all Israel played before God with all their might, was singing in the harps and the psalteries, the timbrels, the cymbals, the trumpets. They were having a time, boy. The anger of the Lord was kindled. He smote him because he put his hand to the ark, and he died before the Lord. In Numbers chapter 4, verse 15, And when Aaron and his sons made an end of covering the sanctuary and all the vessels of the sanctuary, as camp is to set forward, after that the sons of Kohath shall come to bear it, but they shall not touch any holy thing, lest they die. Listen at that. These things are the burden of the sons of Kohath and the tabernacle of the congregation. It was already explained to the priesthood that you are not to touch one holy thing or you're dead. And now here, here comes Uzzah. <laughs> nope, God's not pleased with that. And then David gets angry at God for doing that, for killing him. He got angry with the Lord. But I want you to understand that the problem wasn't with the Lord. The problem was with David. Okay, God's not impressed with new carts. God's not impressed with worldly attempts at doing what he's told us to do. The way they want to worship. You can't just, we, we see it clear back in, in the gar, after the garden when we see that Cain was bringing forth what was from the cursed ground to give an offering to God. And we all know that in the Bible your offering is attached to your worship. So here, here Lord, here's my curse. Let me lay it before you and give it back to you. No. It's not accepted. If you've done well, would it not be accepted? Why are you mad now? Why are you wroth now? It's because it's not accepted. God doesn't just accept any old thing you want to throw up to him. He doesn't want to, he won't accept just any old way. He won't accept just any old thing you feel that you want to give him. God has asked for what he wants. He wants people to worship him in spirit and in truth. And he seeks for such. He seeks out those that will. He knew David would. But see, David right now is... He's just, he's just along for the ride right here. This is a picture of when David is doing all this dancing and there's all the cymbals and the harps and the, and the timbrets and all the different stuff. There's a giant party going on and he's out there dancing. Well, guess what? God didn't tell him to dance. God didn't tell him to do all that stuff. And they were doing it all wrong. It was not the way God wanted. It's what they wanted. That kind, of, that kind of thing is good for our flesh, but guess what? God's not interested in our flesh. He's interested in our spirit and worshiping him within the confines of our spirit in truth, which is the word of God. We consult the word of God to find out what the truth is, and we with our spirit now can take this information and worship the Lord. That is what it's talking about, okay? So this new cart was not good. 
It's of worldliness and worldly ways uh, to do these things. The new card of entertainment, one preacher said, the time's going to come when preachers feed, quit feeding the sheep and begin to entertain the goats. And that's what we see. It's goat entertainment, man. You know what's disappointing? Petting zoos. I've got kids, and we've gone through all kinds of petting zoos. And do you know what they have more of than anything else? Goats. They're creepy. They're, I'm, it's, it's, it's just messed up. You look at one of those things, and they're creepy. There's that new cart of that entertainment, that new cart of shallow preaching, that, that new cart of perverted Bibles. I just uh, educated a preacher friend of my wife uh, and his wife uh, about the, the the existence of the Queen James Bible that exists, and it's for it's for that community. Yes, they have made the Queen James Bible uh, especially for that that group. They had no they had no idea. I said, yeah, there's a new perverted Bible that comes out all the time. Absolutely. Wouldn't want to have anything to do with that. Or any of the other ones. I mean, one whoredom, which whoredom do you take? I mean, they're all abominations before the Lord. So that's, well, you know, the list could go on. But we as God's people need to cling to the old paths. Wherein is the good way? Hebrews 12, 14, follow peace with all men and holiness uh, without which no man shall even see the Lord. Sometimes good men get things wrong, but great men correct them and get things right. You know what? Many times that's happened. Good guys just got it wrong. But you know what? To continue to follow the wrong, even though someone was good that instituted the wrong, is not going to get us close to God. The greatness will come along and will fix the wrong and make it right because that's what we're supposed to do. As men of God, that's what we're supposed to do. And that's how it is. You know, and, and a lot of times, you know, preachers like me will get, will get flack about preaching hard and, you know, and I'm not the only one that preaches hard. Lots of good preachers that preach hard. But you know what? When Jonah went... God said, you will preach the preaching that I bid thee. He didn't get the option to choose. This is what you do. God wants that. God needs that. And that's how we need to be. So in the second part of 2 Samuel, the verses 12 through 23, we find David's second attempt at moving the Ark of the Covenant back to the tabernacle where it belonged. Now... He, he now moves the ark after due order, and God is pleased. That second half. Like, you, you saw all the stuff that went wrong. He was afraid to bring it into his house. So he, 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 he put it over there with Obed-Edom for three months. And because the ark dwelled with Obed-Edom, God blessed everything that pertained to him because he, ho he housed the, the, the Ark of the Covenant in his home. Can you imagine having the Ark of the Covenant in your home? And three months having God in your house. And three months having everything that pertains to you go, go platinum, man. Can you imagine that? And then it reports came back to David. Oh, uh, by the way, yeah, you know how you left the ark over there? Yeah, you might want to check that guy out. Everything he does and even pertains to him is blessed by God. You sure you want to leave it there, man? Oh, we're going to bring that to the house. We're going to go get that, and we're going to come to the house. As a matter of fact, uh, in other passages of Scripture, Obed-Edom, he, he wasn't exactly in the camp with the, with the house of Israel. But you know what? Because God blessed everything he had, he joined up. He left that all there. He said, I want to be wherever that is. Wherever that is, I want to be because that's real. 
That blessed me. I had that, and I did not have the kind of things that went on when I had that in my house. I want to be wherever that is. And he followed it wherever it went and stayed near to God. God is pleased. In this text, we find several aspects of David's public worship that we can apply to our lives. David worshiped in obedience, verse 12. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom into the city of David. See, earlier David did the right thing the wrong way, and it cost him a, it cost him a good man. Uzzah was a good man. All right, God's not impressed with these new cards. See, spirit is nothing without truth, and truth is always after the due order. We see in John 4, chapter, uh, chapter 4, verse 23, but the hour cometh and now is when the true, worship, true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. David sought after the Lord, and he got it right. And buddy, there's a difference when you get it right versus when you don't have it right. There's a huge, enormous difference. David worshiped, secondly, in gladness. He did it with gladness. People no longer enjoy God's house. They just endure it or ignore it or forget it nowadays. Psalm 122.1, a song of degrees of David. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Psalm 27, 4 and 5, one thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord, to acquire in his temple, for in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion, in the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me upon a rock. Psalm 42, 4. When I remember these things, I pour out my soul in me, for I had gone with the, mul gone with the multitude. I went with them to the house of God with the voice of joy and praise with a multitude that kept the holy day. Thirdly, David worshiped with sacrifice. You know, and we find that in verses 13 and 17 that he was doing these uh, peace offerings and burnt offerings before the Lord. And, of course, you know, you, you have to, we, we talked about our giving. We talked about bringing it in and how important that that is. I don't have to go there. We all know Malachi in uh, chapter 3, uh, verses 8 through 10. Uh, and, and then over there in 2 Corinthians, because some people believe that it's just an Old Testament thing. But, it's not. It's a New Testament thing. It's all through the Bible thing. 2 Corinthians 9, verse 6 and 7, I'll read that one. But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. Listen, we can't just give grudgingly or even because it's necessary. Right? We know that giving is necessary. Right? But don't just give because it's necessary. God loves a cheerful giver. Be happy. Be thrilled to be bringing this before him. One of the greatest things uh, and thrills in the Christian life is the worshiping and giving and that can happen as well as, and as there's more to it than just the, the, the financial, just even giving yourselves. Fourthly, David worshiped with all his might. Listen, the king of Israel was actively engaged in worship. You know, as your pastor, I want to be involved in the worship service. I like to sing. I, that's why you see me do it. Yeah, you know what? I could try to bring other people in. I could try to help other people come up and sing. And I, I encourage that. But I, as your pastor, I don't want to just sit back and wait for the time to preach. I want to be involved. That's, that's my heart. It's my heart to be involved. I, and that's something that I've always tried to be is involved in the service. And, and there's been times when we were receiving the offering and I didn't have anything else that I could do that I came up and I stood there and I held a plate. And I went forth and I just, just did that or holding the door or, or helping here or helping there, being in part of the worship of the Lord. 
right? We have to do everything we do to do to the glory of God. We find that in 1 Corinthians 10, 31. David worshiped with noise, verses 15 and 16. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of a trumpet. Hey, it got pretty, got pretty loud. It got pretty loud worshiping the Lord. And uh, in Psalm chapter 100, verse 1 through 4, is a psalm of praise. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving, and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him, and bless his name. Sing it loud, sing it proud. Psalm 98, 4, make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all the earth. Make a loud noise, rejoice, and sing praise. Next, David worshiped with blessing. He turned and he blessed the people in verses 18 and 20. He returned to his household after he blessed everybody in the name of the Lord of hosts. He wanted to be a blessing to people. We need to make sure that we are a blessing to our church. I find verse 20 interesting. I hadn't noticed this before, but David went home to bless his wife, and he was met with disdain and criticism. I mean, think about that. Now, Michal was Saul's daughter. She would have been better off blessed than to be cursed. But she had a tood, and she let it go. And it, it did not work out so great for her. Seventhly, David worshiped shamelessly. Verses 20 through 22, then David returned to bless his household. And Michal, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said, how glorious. Can you hear it? Can you hear the, the attitude? Listen to this. He's, how glorious was the king of Israel today, who uncovered himself today in the eyes of the handmaidens of his servants as one of the vain fellows shamelessly uncovereth himself. Can you hear the tude? I mean, it's there. It's ever-present. David said unto Michal, it was before the Lord which chose me before thy father and before all his house to appoint me ruler over the people of the Lord, over Israel. Therefore will I play before the Lord, and yet, uh, and I will yet be more vile than thus, and will be base in mine own sight. And of the maid servants which thou hast spoken of, of them shall I be had in honor. So, Michal was ashamed of David, but David was not intimidated by her criticism. Sometimes you can have criticism right, right, in, right in the doors of your own house. But you know what? We cannot be intimidated by that. We have to be strong and reassured that it is before the Lord. And it doesn't matter what somebody says. It's before the Lord. It's between me and God, and God's chosen me. God wants me to worship. God wants me to give. God wants me to sing. God wants me to preach. God wants me to serve. God's done this, and it doesn't matter what anybody else says. They can be ashamed. Go ahead and say what you want to say, but I don't care. Sometimes you just got to be that way. Because if you're doing right and somebody else is coming against what you're doing, they're fighting against God, and God will take care of them. Don't give them no mind. Don't pay them no mind. Just go on with it and do what you do before the Lord. Romans 10, 11, for the scripture saith, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Never be ashamed of the Lord Jesus Christ. Never be ashamed to worship him. In conclusion, King David was a man of worship. King David was a man after God's own heart. That's a direct thing to David. Yes, you know what? You'll hit a home run with contentment. You'll hit a home run with character. But you know what? You'll hit a grand slam with worship. You'll hit a grand slam with worship. 
That is what God is trying to tell us. Those are some of the things that just made David a man after God's own heart, even with all the faults and the failures, even with all the things that were ill-advised, God says, right there it is, you're a man after my own heart. And that's what we can learn. You know what? We saw where the Lord, the Lord is of war, and he was of war. He had a war in his heart. All right, he went to war. He was, you know, right from, right from the get-go, right from the youth department, he jumped right out and fought the biggest giant in the stinking land. Is it any wonder that he had war and, and that God used him that way for battles? Because you know what? It's the Lord that fights battles. And David was fighting the battle in the name of the Lord God. So that just kind of synchronizes you to the heart of God. Because you know what? It's not all cupcakes and rainbows. You got to fight. You got to war sometimes. Sometimes it's not easy speaking. Sometimes it does take passion. Sometimes it does take drive. Sometimes it does say, who do you think you are to say something against my God? Sometimes it takes that. And uh, the Lord gave me a special, a special message for Sunday morning. I, I can't hardly wait to preach it. It's good stuff. Good stuff what the Lord shows. Good stuff the way the Lord leads. So I want to just encourage you, fight that good fight. Stay in the good godly perimeter. If you're wondering how to do it, get into the Word of God. And you've heard a lot about what God expects out of us as far as if we're going to have that kind of good rapport with God, we need to be able to come before Him. We need to be able to give Him what He wants from us. You know, there's no better gift that you can get somebody than something you know they really want. That's what, it, that's what it's all about. You know, it's so fun when you're, when you're trying to pick out ideas. And we used to do this with the kids all the time, still do. And we'd ask them, you know, what do you really want? You know, what do you really want? Whether it was for a birthday or, you know, and, or, or Christmas time. What do you really, really want? What, what, do you just, oh, what would you just flip out if you got? And we would do our dead level best to try to do that. I remember one year, I'll never forget this. I think Isaac was probably eight years old, I want to say. And, you know, growing up in a preacher's home, you, you, you know that there's not money there <laughs> a lot of times. There's just, it, you know, it, it's, it's not a, a lavish lifestyle for, for a God-called preacher. Charlatans, on the other hand, no, I'm not going to go there. But he really wanted an Xbox. He said, like, he said, I know you guys can't do it. You know, it's just, you know, we're kind of late in the game, too, and we're just trying to figure out what we're going to do. Oh, I don't, I'd really love an Xbox, man. I, I would just love that. But he said, whatever you guys get me is fine. Whatever you guys, I'll love whatever you get me. Just don't, you know, don't, I know that's a really big, because that was like, at the time, it was like 500 bucks. That's a steep want, you know what I'm saying? But... But praise God for layaway. That's all I got to say. Well, that's what we did. We went, we went over there. We, we, uh, we took advantage of layaway, and we put all this stuff on there, and we're just making payments as we go and was able to get it out, and we or hit it. And so we got this really big idea. It's, okay, that's kind of a small box, and he's going to know immediately. So we can't leave it. We can't leave it looking like that. I said, get a bigger box. We'll put it inside there and fill it full of different, you know, papers and whatever. We'll make him work for it, you know. I'm spending that much money. He's going to be working for it. <laughs> and God had just blessed us because, you know, we, we just prayed, Lord, you know, we just want to be good to our kids, and we don't ask for a lot. We don't, you know, it's not the big things that we always want, but 
we just really wanted it bad to be able to do something, something just, just, just for the good, just, you know, just being good to your kids. It's just loving on them and being good and trying to encourage them. And, uh, and so I, we, we got it on video somewhere. I have this video. He dug, he opened this big box. He's like, whoa, what's that? So he, he gets over there and I, I, I took the knife and I opened, you know, opened it cause I wouldn't let him have it. And, uh, he started digging through that thing and digging through that thing. And, man, there's a lot of papers in here. What, what's this? And, like, he saw the box. He saw it. We wrapped it before we put it in there. So, you know, at least have one more layer to get through. And, uh, and but he, he kind of was, what? You know, it was already starting. You could see it building. And he opened that up and saw that Xbox, and he bawled. How did you afford that? That was the first thing out of his mouth. That's too much money. How did you do that? I mean, bawling. And just proclaiming we were the best parents ever. And you see something like that, and it's like, wow, that's what makes it happen, folks. When you can give something to someone that they really want. Well, God wants that. Amen. How much has he given to us? And he's told me, he said, this is what I want. This is what I really want. Why would we would be foolish not to give him what he wants? And how excited that the Lord is when we do. When he seeks and he finds those that worship him in spirit and in truth. How awesome is that? That's so cool. So I think we ought to give God what he wants. Because look at how much he's given us. And he is the best father ever. Ever. How much he's done for us. And oh, how little we do for him. May God encourage our hearts and prick our hearts at the same time to do more, to do better, because we can. Let's pray. Heavenly